This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garrett. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Up to the minute stock market news and in depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Snowed in. Stocks barely budge as the Northeast digs out. But don't let today's lack of big market moves fool you. There's one thing professional investors are watching very closely, and it's not the weather. Slow lane. The big automakers didn't sell as many cars in December as expected, and now some are wondering whether the slowing pace of sales will continue in the new year. Brighter future. Company pension funds are the healthiest they've been in six years. Why that could bode well for corporate earnings in 2014. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, January 3rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Susie Garab is off tonight. Well, no time for panic or even a double cocktail, but stocks aren't exactly off to a great start so far this year. Day two in the markets, day two of declines for the S&P 500, the first such two-day losing streak to begin a year since 2005. Yes, the losses today were minuscule for the S&P, fractional in fact, but losses they were on this mixed and chilly day on Wall Street. The Dow did manage a small gain. Stocks rallied a bit around midday as traders watched outgoing Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke give what may be his final big speech before stepping down at month end. Speaking to the American Economic Association in Philadelphia, Bernanke gen had generally positive things to say about the U.S. economy. The combination of financial healing, greater balance in the housing market, less fiscal restraint, and of course, continued monetary policy accommodation bodes well for U.S. economic growth in coming quarters. Well, the Bernanke pep talk helped, but wasn't exactly a jolt of Red Bull. Here are today's final numbers. The Dow up, but just a modest 28 points. The Nasdaq was lower by 11, and the S&P was a fraction of a point lower. Well, big blue chip stocks have started the new year haltingly. Dominic Chu reports now on why many market pros are watching, by contrast, small, fast-growing companies even more closely than those suddenly stumbling big company shares. The skies are getting just a bit darker for some investors. It's not a full-blown storm yet, but many traders are keeping a close eye on one important part of the stock market, small cap stocks. They had a rocky start to 2014, and there's a big reason why investors care. They're considered by many experts to be leading indicators for the overall market and economy. Small cap's important because small cap companies are the largest employer in the U.S. So what they're doing is very reflective of what would be going on in the U.S. employment market, which is obviously critical. Oftentimes, optimism about the future of the economy leads investors to bet on smaller companies. They're the ones with room to grow. But they're also the ones that get hit the hardest in tough economic times. Since hitting a 52-week high back on December 23rd, small cap stocks, as measured by the Russell 2000 index, have underperformed the broader market. And add in underperformance on the first day of trading in 2014, and you get why there's worry brewing. But the trend for stocks has been very positive since the depths of the financial crisis back in 2009. So some traders think any pullback could be considered a buying opportunity. I think the Russell 2000 and 2040 is definitely going higher. I saw the U.S. economy is still the place to play. I think the dollar is going to be strengthening, which means it's going to be good for small cap stocks, especially in the cyclical areas like uh, technology and the industrial names. So I'd be overweight the small cap. No matter what your view, keep an eye on those small cap stocks. A lot of the professionals are. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Our next guest says that what worked last year for investors won't work this year. He's Joe Duran, CEO of United Capital Financial Advisors. Joe, welcome. Good to have you with us. Before I get your answer to why you say things that worked last year won't necessarily this year, let me get your overall take on how you see the U.S. economy in 2014. Chairman Bernanke said he thinks it's getting better. Do you? I totally agree. I think we've seen a, a very nice recovery, especially the back end of the year. And it's broadening. And uh, the Fed uh, hinting at tapering is also telling us that they, they're seeing things that we're not yet seeing, which makes me feel very optimistic about the economy 
and, uh, and a broader and stronger recovery, maybe even over 3% and approaching 4% for this coming year, which is quite encouraging. That is a, a bullish forecast. Now let's uh, talk a little bit about why you say that what worked uh, so well in 2013 may not or won't in 2014. What specifically are you referring to and why? Well, I think two things. First, uh, it's historical that uh, people will typically crowd at the beginning of the year to the things that worked very well last year. But uh, the market is a, a living organism and it changes with time. So what you had at the, for most of last year was a very stagnant and very slow and disappointing recovery. And in times like that, people pay up for high growth, high revenue growing companies. You saw that with Tesla, and uh, Apple for a while, like very high growth, high octane Netflix, they get a premium. Uh, when the broad economy starts to grow even more, uh, it changes and people then shift to more industrial names, less exciting names like General Electric or, or United Technologies that provide infrastructure because it lifts all boats when you get a high growing economy. And so the larger, uh, not so exciting names often do better than in the early stages as we saw last year. So I think what you'll see is a shift from the very uh, well-known top line growers to more stodgy, more boring companies uh, this coming year, which frankly so is not bad because you don't want to invest in last year's winners always. You, you really seem to be saying that, that it's not a year so much maybe for speculation and betting on fast growers, but more a year to be betting on underlying economic growth and uh, earnings per share growth. And the reason you want to do that in a very uh, in a time when the market's already recovered as much as it has. Remember, we've had a 30% year. That's really big. And mm -hmm. so you have more speculation in the market than you had before. And you don't want to do with the most dangerous times in the markets are when nobody sees risk. And we're approaching that now. People are very complacent. They feel very good. And so you want to become a little bit more conservative when everyone becomes a lot more aggressive. And so what we're saying is be more selective invest with stocks that have not doubled or tripled in the last 18 mm -hmm. months, and be safe. Very quick thought. You think that we are due, overdue, for some sharp pullbacks in 2014. How sharp, and why do you say that? Well, uh, it's very unusual to go through six quarters where you do not have a 10% decline. Historical averages every 18 months, you have two 10% declines. We've not had that for 18 months now. And people have become very complacent. So I think the first pullback we have, which could be caused by almost anything, uh, while not a reason to sell, will be a cause for a lot of new investors to get nervous once again. And so the first decline will probably be a 10 to 15 percent decline. And we think very likely mm -hmm. to happen in the next six to nine months, simply because it's been so long since we've had one. Right. And the longer we go without one, the sharper the decline is likely to be and the more scary the first drop will be. We have to leave it there, Joe. Happy New Year from beautiful Irvine, California, here in snowy New Jersey. Joe Duran, yeah. CEO of United Capital Financial Advisors. Well, the auto industry just wrapped up its best annual performance in six years, even though sales last month were a little bit disappointing. Phil LeBeau has more on 2013's blowout year for car and truck sales and what lies ahead in the new year. December was not exactly a month to remember for the auto industry. Sales in the U.S. were well below expectations, with modest gains for Ford and Chrysler, while GM and Toyota actually saw their sales decline. Some in the auto industry blame winter storms for keeping buyers out of showrooms. The weather that swept across the Midwest and into the Northeast uh, had some impact, but you know, the, November was a very strong month. Uh, as far as the industry was concerned, and so there was, there was a little payback there as well. The average price paid for a new model last month was just over $30,000, according to TrueCar.com. And because demand remained relatively strong, automakers didn't have to jack up incentives in order to close sales. What did well in December? Trucks and SUVs. They were hot just as they were for most of 2013, thanks to moderate gas prices. Trucks are cyclical, so they're in kind of an upward swing right now. As are auto sales for the entire industry. Just four years after the recession, when annual sales bottomed out, they've steadily climbed to more than 15 million vehicles sold last year. That's led to more plants adding shifts and workers as they keep up with demand that should continue to grow, although at a slightly slower pace. As we move throughout 2014, 
the rate of growth is going to slow just a bit. Um, you're not going to see the same rate of growth that we saw in 2012 and perhaps not the same, same rate of growth that we saw here this last year in 2013. As much as things changed in 2013, with newer vehicles like the Tesla Model S becoming hot sellers last year, some things remain the same. Take the Ford F-Series pickup truck. In 2013, it was the best-selling vehicle in the United States for the 32nd straight year. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. That is some kind of win streak. Well, a $1 billion internet security acquisition was announced today, and Wall Street ate it up. Shares of a company called FireEye, which is buying rival Mandiant, shot up nearly 37% on the news of the deal. And some think today's takeover could kickstart a wave of acquisitions in the cybersecurity space. Josh Lipton has more. Hacking is a huge problem for companies in the U.S. and worldwide. It was that massive attack on Target's customers involving 40 million credit and debit card accounts. And just this week, there was a security breach on Snapchat, a mobile app where more than 4 million Snapchat users had personal information leaked. But now there's a deal that could shake up the cybersecurity landscape. FireEye is buying Mandiant for about $1 billion. Mandiant made a name for itself last year when it released a report detailing suspected activities of a Chinese military hacking unit. FireEye knows whether your company has been hacked, and Mandiant can tell who attacked you and the damage that has been done. Quite a few major... FireEye CEO Dave DeWalt says the partnership will fight off the growing cybersecurity threat. Just yesterday, we saw the Syrian Electronic Army bringing down, you know, obviously uh, Skype. We're seeing a lot of infrastructure type attacks like that, Twitter, the Associated Press. And some are very successful, sometimes they're, they're not, but there's a lot of uh, very egregious activities happening in the world right now. And I view this as just the tip of the iceberg. Dan Ives of FBR says this deal also creates a security platform that poses a real challenge to rivals in the sector like Symantec and Intel's McAfee. FireEye stock raced higher today. The stock is up more than 175% since it went public last September. Ive says to expect more consolidation in the cybersecurity sector in 2014, companies like Proofpoint, Imperva, and Fortinet are all potential takeout targets. Security has become so key. Without security, customers won't go there. So that's why I see the EMCs, the IBMs, the Oracles, the Microsofts looking more into security for acquisitions, similar to what we saw with Cisco SourceFire last year. So again, I view this as just the start of what I view as a pretty active year for M&A in the sector. FireEye was considered a possible acquisition candidate, but analysts say the company is now signaling that it's a consolidator, not a takeout target itself. Josh Lipton, Nightly Business Report, Silicon Valley. Still ahead, corporate pension funds are finally getting fit. And their healthier funding levels could also mean stronger corporate profits in the new year. Good news for some retirees, corporate pension funds are now in the best shape since before the Great Recession, and that could help tone up corporate profits in the year ahead. Mary Thompson has more now. The 2013 stock market rally and rising corporate bond yields delivering record relief for corporate pensions last year. We had everything working in our favor. Liabilities went down, assets went up, and the funded status improved sharply. Two studies by Mercer and Towers Watson finding pension funding for the S&P 1500 and Fortune 1000 companies both topping 90% in 2013, their highest level since 2007. The S&P's 29% rally boosting the value of the fund's underlying equity assets, while rising yields on high-grade corporate debt helped on the liability side. A liability is a present value of a future benefit payment. So under pension accounting, as high-grade corporate yields go up, liabilities go down and overall pension funding increases. Alan Glickstein, a senior retirement consultant for Towers Watson, estimates this should improve the balance sheets of the Fortune 1000 companies to the tune of $285 billion. 
that improved balance sheet also has an impact on the charge against profits that these companies will calculate for 2014. So it will improve their earnings picture by lowering their cost of pensions. Not all firms affected equally, though. Reaping the biggest benefit? Firms with big pensions like telecom companies and older industrial firms. As the funds approach or exceed 100% funding, Mercer's Jonathan Berry expects companies to de-risk or move the assets out of stocks and into bonds or annuities or offer voluntary cash outs to employees, all helping to smooth earnings by eliminating lumpy pension expenses. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson. To read more about the rebound in company pension funds, head to our website, nbr.com. Well, shares of Delta Airlines took off after the company said it saw per seat revenue jump more than expected last month. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The late Thanksgiving holiday, which kept travelers away until early December, helped the airline uh, up revenue per passenger by 10 percent last month. The fuel costs also 3 percent less per gallon than Delta had predicted. That turns into real money, and it pleased investors. The stock up 5.5 percent to $29.23. General Electric was downgraded by Oppenheimer to perform from outperform. The firm said GE stock price now reasonably reflects earnings expectations. That's because, according to the analysts there, 2014 will be a transitional period for the company as it refocuses on its industrial businesses. Shares of GE down slightly, 2748, the close there. We told you earlier this week that Hertz adopted a shareholder rights plan or poison pill to protect itself from a possible takeover. Well, today there are reports that Carl Icahn is the target of that poison pill because he purchased 30 to 40 million shares of the car rental company. There was also buzz that Dan Loeb took a stake in the company as well as Corvex Capital. Shares were down today at Hertz by 18 cents. They finished at 28.50. Uh, down two-thirds of a percent. And the cereal maker General Mills started producing its iconic Cheerios cereal with no genetically modified content, otherwise known as GMOs. The company switched its sugar and corn sources to address the growing controversy over the use of those GMOs. A spokesperson for uh, General Mills said the change required a significant investment and only applies to the original flavored Cheerios, not to other types like Honey Nut. Today, shares fell a fraction there to $49.26. And Liberty Media, owned by John Malone, wants to make satellite radio provider Sirius XM a wholly owned subsidiary. Liberty already owns a majority stake, wants to buy the remaining shares. The proposal values Sirius common shares at around $3.68. Sirius finished the day at $3.57, and Liberty Media closed slightly higher at 145.33. Our market monitor guest tonight says U.S. equity markets will post mid single digit returns in 2014, and he expects international markets to do considerably better. He's Wasif Latif, Vice President of Equity Investments at USAA Investments. Wasif, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you, Tyler. Why do you think the U.S. market will have comparatively a very modest uh, gaining year in 2014? Well, you've been on a tear on the equity markets, particularly in the U.S. The returns have been so strong for quite a while. As your earlier guest pointed out as well, uh, you know, a pullback may be in order, but that may also reflect a reduction, a gradual reduction in the quantitative easing or the bond buying program. And so we think that uh, given all the factors, especially the fact that the profit margins of U.S. companies uh, are at all-time highs, that makes for a mix where the returns going forward for next year, for this year, uh, are, are likely to be tepid, whereas on the US, non-U.S. side outside the country, you're likely to see slightly better results because the margins are lower, there's more room for upside on those margins, and the valuations are more attractive. Valuations are better. That doesn't mean, though, uh, Wasif, that you don't have some choices that you'd like to share with our viewers tonight. Why don't we start with your first one, uh, which is Gilead. Uh, tell us what is going to drive that stock to better gains this year. Well, as you know, Gilead, the biotech firm, uh, has two specialty drugs uh, among a lot of the other ones that they have. But the key ones that has really been driving the stock is their HIV drug, as well as the new one that they have created for hepatitis C. And the early test results for that hepatitis C drug are very, very positive. And that's an untapped market. If uh, 
you look at the U.S. market, there's about 4 million folks uh, estimated in the country to have hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. So that creates a pretty big market for them. And that's just the U.S. Uh, that's not to mention the global market potential out there. So it's it's a pretty good growth story. The stock has run uh, right. in 2013, but we think there's more rooms for upside there. Let's try and get these next three in. You go old, old school with your next sure. pick, Occidental Petroleum. Yeah, it, you know, the, the others are, are more stodgy. They're more stayed and steady. And it really is a reflection of a look at the market to say you need to be a bit more cautious and picky and choosy. So Oxy is is a company with attractive valuations. There's a restructuring story there where they've been uh, trying to sell their non-U.S. assets and some of the assets in California. And we think those assets create a lot of cash flow that's going to come in to help pay down debt or buy back shares. Mm -hmm. And they have a good dividend with right. an increase to boot. Let's get two for one here. Or give me 20 seconds on your final two picks, uh, Cisco Systems and Microsoft. Well, you know, these are the old uh, technology companies. They're not the new ones, but they're the old ones. And they're, they're good value stories. They're both attractively valued, and they both pay a good dividend. They're, they have a lot of cash flow business that continues to generate all of that cash flow, and the dividend is, uh, is steadily growing as well. What do you think will happen with Microsoft when they get a new CEO? Does it depend all on the CEO? Quick thought. Uh, not necessarily. Obviously, there will be a quick reaction from the market, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the, market, the, the stock's long-term trajectory is based on whoever the immediate CEO will be. Do you have any disclosures on the stocks you just mentioned? Do you own them? Your company owns them, I assume? Well, we own them in our funds. The ones that I manage, uh, we own those stocks in our funds, yes. All right, Wasif, thank you very much. Wasif Latif is vice president of equity investments at USAA Investments. And coming up... The big money being invested by big gaming companies on the Las Vegas Strip and not just in casinos, but will it pay off? A big vote taking place today in Washington State. Union machinists at Boeing will decide whether to accept a contract that includes some givebacks of some pension and health care benefits. The carrot in the deal, Boeing says if the union goes along, the company will build its new 777X jets in the Seattle area. Local union officials are urging their 30,000 members to oppose the deal, saying they'd have to give up too much while company profits are sky high. Now, Boeing has already begun exploring moving the 777X assembly to other states if the union rejects this latest contract offer. Well, after getting slammed by the recession and hit hard by the housing crisis, Las Vegas is now betting big with new hotels, casinos, and entertainment complexes slated to open this year. So will 2014 be a strong year for Sin City? Jane Wells went to Vegas. Do you guys want to come get a photo? Las Vegas, America's adult Disneyland, is showing signs of life. Well, we saw a demonstrable improvement in 13. Nearly 40 million people visited Sin City in 2013, a new record which should be topped this year. Hotel room rates are going up. And in the most surprising sign of a turnaround, $9 billion in development projects are in the works. The recovery here is really a tale of two cities. The Vegas for Americans is doing okay. Gaming revenue's up maybe 2%. The Vegas for foreigners is doing great, up double digits. So the airport just added a new terminal to accommodate more international flights. Uh, international represents about 17% of the market share today. We want to grow that to 30 percent. Challenges remain. As the median age of visitors gets younger, turns out young people don't play slots, which account for 80 percent of gaming profits. In a, a time when the gamers, the younger people that are on their smartphones, uh, have to be addressed from a gaming perspective. And I think you're going to find in 14 and 15 far more interactive games. Also, the ever-increasing number of clubs may be reaching a saturation point. The growth in nightclubs has been significant over the last couple of years, and uh, the cost of running that business has increased um, pretty dramatically, and now we have three or four more clubs coming into the market this coming year. 
So John Unwin at the Cosmopolitan hopes to shake up the concept with a throwback dinner club like the new Rose Rabbit Lie. Caesars is looking to cash in on the faster growing businesses outside the casino with a new shopping experience called Link, including a Ferris wheel bigger than the London Eye. And the largest player on the strip, MGM Resorts, has announced plans to build a new arena which could eventually host an NBA or NHL team. Las Vegas, it's really not just for gambling anymore. The fact that people are willing to invest again in Las Vegas, I think, is a, an affirmation that people see this recovery. I'd say my colleagues in, in Las Vegas are pretty encouraged about 2014. Uh, and, and, and they're backing that up with a lot of capital investment uh, into the market, as are we. And that may be the biggest bet in town. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Las Vegas. Finally tonight, for the first time since the revolution in 1959, residents of Cuba will be able to buy new and used cars on what passes for the open market there. Until now, Cubans had to get permission from the government first and then to shop for a car, but only from state-run dealers. But it won't be easy, these new uh, practices. Cars are still very expensive there. The least expensive new car for sale on the island is a 2013 Peugeot, and it costs about $91,000, while the average income in Cuba is about $22 U.S. dollars per month. And because of State Department trade restrictions, no U.S. cars, new ones that is, are being sold there. And that's a nightly business report for tonight. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, everyone. Stay warm. We'll see you Monday. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Up to the minute stock market news and in depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. I'm Tyler Matheson with a nightly business report news brief. Day two in the markets for 2014, and it's the first two-day losing streak to kick off a new year since 2005. Today's losses were small, and the blue-chip Dow stocks even managed a modest gain. The Dow today up 28 points. The Nasdaq was lower by 11, but the S&P 500 logged a loss a fraction of a point. In what may be his final speech before stepping down at the end of the month, outgoing Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said the factors that kept the economy from growing for so long appear to be letting up. And he predicts stronger growth in the months ahead. December auto sales disappointed with General Motors and Toyota seeing sales declines. Uh, but the auto industry did wrap up its best year since 2007. And tune in to Nightly Business Report here on your public television station.